Okay, everybody. So <clears throat> I want to welcome you here to uh, this Contagion Cultures lecture. For those of you online who have not met me before, my name is Warren Maybe. I'm the director of the School of Policy Studies here at Queen's University. Uh, and before I get into introducing our speakers and uh, talking about future events, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm currently sitting uh, here at Queen's on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Now, we have people coming in from all over, so you may be sitting on very different territories. Uh, please take a moment to acknowledge those territories. It's our privilege to be able to uh, live and to work and to learn uh, on these lands. I'm really excited uh, about today's talk, um, the world of work in a post-pandemic world. Uh, <clears throat> we have two of our uh, distinguished fellows and faculty members, uh, Don Drummond and Patrick Deutscher, who are here to uh, give us a, a little bit of feedback and an update on work that they've been doing, looking at this world of work in a post-pandemic world. Um, <clears throat> Next week, we have a, a talk from Adnan Hussein uh, called The Black Death, A Global Pandemic and Its Consequences in the Middle Ages, uh, looking at these historical uh, parallels, so I'm really looking forward to that. And the week after that, we have Mark Schwartz uh, talking about libraries and COVID-19. So we have a, uh, an excellent series of talks coming up, uh, which I encourage you to uh, come in and take part in. I do want to take uh, a moment to thank all of you for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. Uh, in today's talk, um, we'll be um, you know, uh, taking questions through the Q&A function. The Q&A function is found at the bottom of your screen. If you just move your mouse around, you'll see the Q&A button. You can click that, uh, and it's a great place to post your questions. I'll also monitor the chat. So if you do put questions into the chat, I'll monitor that as well. Uh, we're going to start off uh, by handing over to our speakers. So, uh, Pat, I believe you're going to kick things off, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I think I am unmuted, and uh, um, thank you, Warren, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thank you again for uh, all of you for uh, joining us today. I want to take uh, just a second also to uh, talk about uh, sort of the origins of the talk today. It, uh, um, when we were all uh, sent back home in the spring and early summer, uh, the School of Policy Studies established uh, a number of uh, working groups to uh, address some of the big issues that were arising because of the, uh, the pandemic. And one of them was a working group on uh, COVID and the economy. And we got together and uh, narrowed it down very slightly, I would say, to uh, COVID and uh, the world of work. And uh, there were a lot of people that I'm going to uh, um, acknowledge now that uh, contributed to the, uh, the study. Please, um, if you were participants and I leave you out, uh, uh, it's inadvertent. It's a, a bit of a long list, but let me let me go through this. Um, I'm going to start. The Honorable Hugh Siegel uh, participated. Uh, Leo Ehrlichman, Abdullah Hussein, Saif Hussein, Spencer McDonald, Fiza Mirza, Rafit Nawaz, Carol Trudell, uh, Rebecca Wisink, who joined us from Cultural Studies, Shilin Hong, and Tuba. Mashadi. And I want to uh, particularly uh, note the contribution of uh, Julia Orlando Rohr, who was uh, not only uh, one of the lead writers uh, and uh, primary researchers, but also was tasked with uh, keeping us on track, uh, which was a very, a very big job. Uh, again, apologies to anyone that I have omitted. There were certainly others who participated in some of the conversations that we had early on. So let me turn to our, our subject. I kind of, I think of it in three ways. Um, I break it down into three Marse Marshallian categories that I'm misusing a bit. A short-term effect of on jobs, uh, which is essentially the direct impact of COVID and the restrictions. 
the second, a medium term impact, uh, which I think of as uh, sort of the macroeconomic consequences that are to some degree similar to uh, any economic shock. And finally, long term impacts, which come from structural changes in the economy and in the way that we behave. Um, so I'm now going to uh, try to share a slide, share a, a very short slideshow. It's a familiar topic um, to many of you. Um, and uh, the impact on the economy uh, and to jobs as a result of the pandemic is something that sort of vied with uh, the impact of COVID on our health in terms of uh, attention and uh, perhaps not importance, but certainly attention. Um, this chart shows um, the COVID crisis, which is that very yellow V-shaped, uh, hard to call it a curve, it's uh, so sharp in this graph, um, with the three big uh, recessions that the Canadian economy experienced uh, from the early 1980s until um, the most recent one being the financial crisis of, uh, that started up, it's labeled September 2008. And uh, the COVID shock is a suspiciously V-shaped um, um, decline and rapid recovery in employment. And we've been taken to naming our uh, economic cycles after letters, and this one's a bit deceptive. Perhaps it's uh, it's V for virus. The origins and the shape of this have nothing to do, or little to do, with the economy, uh, but a lot to do with how the uh, how the virus uh, is affecting us. Um, the job loss, of course, was unprecedented. It's uh, and I wanted to avoid that word, but I failed rapidly. Um, we've never seen uh, anything like it. Canada shed over 3 million jobs in March and April. And then over the next five months, we got more than 2 million net additional jobs back. Now note that the, the bottom of uh, the most recent point coming from last Friday's numbers for September in this slide is still below any of the other recessions for the same number of months relative to the peak. Um, we're 723,000 jobs below the February peak with the most recent number. I should note also that um, the job loss itself is only a partial indicator of uh, the hit on the labor market. Um, those 3 million jobs that were lost um, during the recession were equivalent to a 16% uh, decline in employment. But the, uh, the estimated decline from Statistics Canada in hours worked over the same period, the same two months, was 28%. So there were a lot of people who were counted as employed and who some of them were still working, uh, but they either worked zero hours or worked a lot fewer hours. And that's a sort of better indicator of the, the hit on the economy. Now, what's likely to happen going forward, uh, we will see. I would have to say that there's been a certain amount of surprise at the pace of uh, the comeback from uh, the bottom. Each month, the jobs have done a little bit better uh, than a consensus of forecasters. Um, but what's going to happen going forward is, um, is obviously uncertain. And one of the factors is that it's, it's being dictated by the, the pace, by what's happening with the virus. And right now those numbers are going in the wrong direction. And some of the industries that are most affected are um, being subject to uh, renewed, more localized, more targeted uh, downturns. And those began in the month of October. So perhaps, uh, perhaps we'll see a pause or at least a slower pace of recovery in the next month. Um, this slide, just to take a quick look at uh, the sectors, shows um, the sectoral at a very broad level distribution of the, of the change in employment. So then the 
my left hand side, I think yours too, shows uh, at the bottom you see the industries that were hardest hit and at the top those that were least uh, hit in terms of loss of employment. And so at the bottom you see accommodation, hotels, motels, food services, restaurants, bars, um, information, culture, and recreation, live events, for example, cinemas, um, other services, and, uh, and construction. And uh, of course, there's reasons for that pattern. The, uh, the industries that uh, were hardest hit um, are typically those that put people, either workers or workers and customers or customers all together in close quarters and therefore made them likely spots where uh, the virus could spread. And those were also industries that were not deemed essential. So there are industries such as healthcare, uh, hospital workers, for example, uh, obviously in very close quarters, uh, unsafe by uh, in pandemic terms, uh, um, but they're deemed essential and we're essential um, because governments do think, spend a lot of time thinking about what's an essential industry and what isn't. Um, retail food workers are another in that category as well, having to work often in close quarters, but also deemed essential. So that was the pattern. Um, on the right hand side, and uh, I'd like to shrink that so I can see it as well. You see what's happened by September. And uh, some of this is very similar. Uh, and at the very bottom, uh, the accommodation and food service workers continue to be uh, the most hard hit. Although you can see by comparing the, uh, the blue line, just the left there for April, and the orange line, that there has been a significant uh, return. In, uh, in employment levels. Um, I want to draw attention to a couple of things that are a bit parenthetical to this, um, and that is uh, the decline, and you see agriculture and construction uh, moving towards the bottom. And those aren't industries per se that were typically um, um, the most, um, where, where workers were very exposed, except in agriculture, in the case of workers who are uh, were engaged in planting and in harvesting, temporary foreign workers being the most famous case. And agriculture is actually the one and only broad sector that has seen a deterioration uh, in comparison to, uh, to April in terms of employment levels. Um, I'd also note sort of in mid-pack uh, natural resources, which is sort of middle of the road in terms of, of uh, job loss relative to the February peak, and it may not have been a peak for that particular sector. Um, and just remind us that in addition to uh, COVID, COVID is undoubtedly the most biggest thing going on in the Canadian labor market overall. But we've also seen, um, and uh, the energy producing parts of the economy uh, have seen most severely uh, the impacts of the decline in uh, oil and gas prices and the setbacks in that industry. I draw attention also to construction, which is, um, at least in proportionate terms, it was sort of, there were shutdowns in construction demanded early on. Now construction is pretty much wide open, but construction employment has uh, one of the sectors where there is the lowest level of uh, performance relative to February. And one of the things that we saw over the course of the summer was uh, the report on investment plans in the economy. And investment intentions took a big hit, which I think you can understand just in terms of the very high level of uh, uncertainty uh, in the economy at that stage. If you were planning on building in particular something like a hotel in January, you might have had, you would likely have had second thoughts if you were at a stage where you could uh, postpone your plans uh, by midsummer. So construction uh, has begun to uh, take a bit of a hit. I'd note that uh, there are a few sectors where employment has risen above February levels. Those are utilities, education, uh, professional, scientific, and technical services. So education is particularly interesting, I think, because um, 
what we're seeing with that is the uh, attention that governments are giving uh, to the return to school, um, which is a, a very big issue in terms of being able to maintain uh, labor force participation uh, on the part of parents and, and very important for kids in terms of uh, being able to, uh, to continue learning. So there has been uh, investment, if I can use that word, in hiring at least to uh, increase uh, capacity, uh, particularly in the, uh, in the school system. And I'm going to just move on to the next slide, though I'm not going to, uh, to talk to it uh, right away. So one of the features of the industries that were hard hit, and not all of them, the pattern is complicated, um, but many of the industries that were hard hit are in those that pay relatively low wages, and they pay the low wages to workers at the front line. And not by coincidence, um, these are disproportionately filled by young workers, by recent immigrants, and by women. And this is, this is something that is not unique to Canada, but is a common international pattern. Now, those industries that, again, that brought workers that in, typically involve workers uh, or workers and customers being in close quarters and therefore being a public health risk in a pandemic, um, some of them were, again, um, essential services. And so those workers typically did not lose jobs. And of course, not all of the frontline workers are uh, lowly paid. Doctors and nurses and airline crews um, are workers who are very well compensated um, and uh, whose work requires extensive education. The workers in that area typically have strong bargaining power and uh, are well remunerated. So the immediate effects of COVID on jobs was really dramatic. And what this is, what we've seen so far is what I've characterized as the uh, short-term effects of the shutdown. And uh, again, of the relaxation of restraints. And the relaxation of restraints has two components in my mind. One is, you know, government saying, okay, go ahead and go back to work. And uh, the other uh, being just people's willingness to uh, engage either as customers or as workers uh, in those activities. Is their fear of becoming sick has uh, changed. But we've advertised this talk as uh, the world of work post COVID. And uh, this is because the crisis is going to have some sustained medium term and long term impacts. And that's been studied by a number, quite a number of economists, both within Canada and internationally, as they've turned their attention to this problem of the day. One uh, early study was by the economists Barrero, Bloom, and Davis of the Becker Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago. And they estimated that in the United States, 42% of COVID related layoffs would result in permanent job loss. Now, and that's not that workers would uh, stay unemployed, but that they would end up in an entirely different job. So let me now talk a bit about uh, the medium term impacts. And as I said before, I think of the medium term impacts as the, uh, the macroeconomic consequences of the negative economic shock. So basically the idea is that a downturn leaves damage in its wake, even once the economy begins to recover and even when it's, it's sort of fully recovered um, by some standard, either employment's returned to its pre-recession level or the employment to population ratio has returned to its level or GDP has got back. Um, but some businesses don't make it through a downturn. They aren't strong enough to survive with the uh, diminished demand that they've experienced. And that means that the jobs that they've provided also don't come back. 
And it means that the workers uh, who fill those jobs need to find alternatives and quite possibly acquire new skills. The, uh, the buildings they occupied stand vacant. And they stand vacant until a new tenant can come to terms with the owner, possibly paying him uh, less rent. The bills and uh, other debts uh, go unpaid and uh, the disappointed creditors or the people who've supplied goods and services before have to absorb the losses. So, you know, getting through these problems takes time and the goal of fiscal and monetary and directly targeted policies is to try to speed that recovery. As I already mentioned, uh, we saw already the decline in uh, investment plans for the summer, which sort of diminishes the uh, near-term potential for productivity gains in the economy. So the experience of past downturns sort of illustrates the damage that can come from this, that uh, the people who are knocked out of employment for any considerable period of time, um, when they find new jobs, uh, they often have to accept or they end up accepting a significant pay cut. And that's particularly true for people or long tenured workers. That is for people who've been in a job with one employer for a considerable period of time. And they've acquired skills, capacity, human capital uh, in that job that are, are specific to what they've been doing. Um, they often, when they find a new job, end up taking a significant pay cut. And it takes time to come back. For older workers, it sometimes mean, means that there is an increased withdrawal from the labor force. Another of those long-term impacts is um, on young workers, and especially graduates, recent graduates who are uh, entering the labor force for the first time. If they have that misfortune, uh, it's well documented uh, that um, they are less likely to be employed at some points far in the future, and also that their earnings are likely to uh, take a hit compared to people who enter the labor force in uh, more buoyant times. So there's very good reason to uh, for governments uh, to uh, try to move us through a downturn uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, yeah, so let me now, I guess basically the COVID crisis is on such a dramatically larger scale than anything we have seen before that those kind of medium term uh, impacts uh, are something that we should be very worried about. Finally, the long-term impacts. And uh, this chart addresses one of the, uh, the first of those uh, uh, working from home. So the long-term impacts I think of as the structural changes. That means people's demand, what customers want to buy what, from their income, the terms on which workers are willing to take jobs, and uh, the decisions uh, of businesses about how to produce. Now, of course, the economy is, is always in motion. Um, we've been talking about automation and technological change and uh, globalization for uh, ages now, and that isn't going away. But again, the COVID crisis is a shock on a massive scale, and uh, it could have far-reaching consequences. In some cases, COVID looks like it could reinforce some pre-existing trends. In others, it you know, could throw some sand in the gears and uh, reverse or slow down at least some of the trends that looked like they were unstoppable before. I don't wanna pretend that uh, we can predict these with any sort of certainty, but some of, the, some of these uh, new developments look like they could stick with us. And I'll talk about a few. And perhaps one of the biggest that we've heard a lot about, all of us, is the increased tendency that people working from home, uh, which uh, we are doing right now, rather than uh, meeting you face to face. Um, and this is a chart uh, which I've cribbed together from Statistics Canada. 
um, which shows the number of people uh, who are working from home each month. And it uh, peaked, according to StatsCan, at about 5 million in April. And they report that normally of those people, 1.7 million of them would have been working from home. Now, we've had this capacity, many of us, to work from home for some time, but it didn't really catch fire uh, before the, uh, the crisis. Now, self-employed are uh, the most likely to work from home at any time, and even back in the 2016 census, it was reported that about a third of the self-employed were working from home. What the chart shows is that, um, I guess the main thing is that uh, still a lot of us working from home, though it did decline each month through August uh, in um, the total number. And so in August, uh, it was down to 3.8 million from the earlier 5.8 million. Then in September, it bumped back up again to uh, four, about 4.2 million, I believe. But the, the September bump, it was still a decline in proportionate terms. And uh, what happens in uh, most Septembers, and fortunately this September too, is that there is a work, return to work from the uh, summer holidays period. So especially uh, women return to the labor force and employment in larger numbers. And so the number working at home rose but uh, so did, and even more, the proportion, uh, the number who were working back in their normal workplaces. Um, so that is a significant uh, trend. And uh, let me just jump to the next slide and my final slide from Statistics Canada. Um, the fact is that uh, both workers and employers resisted the work from home uh, capacity. And it's not a capacity for everybody. This chart, which I've clipped from uh, the StatsCan April Daily, and it packs in uh, a fair bit of information, um, shows estimates along the bottom slide of the sort of capacity to work from home. So along the, the bottom is the percentage of workers whose job involves normally being in close physical proximity. So um, the workers on the left-hand side bubbles are workers who have that, uh, they don't have to be close to their customers or to fellow workers most of the time. So professional workers are way up there. Um, the bottom right-hand corner are, uh, again, it's the, uh, the restaurant workers, the hotel workers, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the colors, uh, denote um, the uh, employment going from February to April, the percentage job loss. And uh, again, there's the accommodation and food workers. Light blue are sort of in the middle. And uh, the light colors suffered, uh, had experienced the smallest uh, job loss. And uh, you can see a uh, significant uh, trend overall. So those workers who were, a were able to uh, generally were work from home. If you were able to work from home, you did. And that's all there was to it. Um, but the pattern isn't entirely clear. So for example, educational services um, in the way at the top, but more to the right hand side, um, those are workers uh, who typically their work involves being in close proximity to their clients, i.e. their students. And uh, they uh, typically are in close contact, uh, but they suffered uh, a smaller employment hit early on. So there was a capacity to work from home and that's what happened. Uh, and uh, now so even more, especially in the, uh, the post-secondary sector where uh, most of us, I suppose, are working from home. And uh, is, this is something that a trend that uh, could well stick. I'm just going to pause here because I want to um, stop sharing slides, um, but let me very quickly finish off. There are, there's pros and cons to working from home. I mean, it's possible that employers wanted to keep an eye on workers and maybe they've learned more how to do that. 
um, workers may uh, enjoy not having to commute to work. It certainly adds time to the day for people with uh, a long commute. On the other hand, it may be very disruptive to home life to uh, need to work from home. And in fact, I think we, we know very little about uh, the long-term impacts on productivity and innovation of needing to, uh, to not be in a workspace. And finally, it, it should be noted that, you know, there, there really are equity, uh, an equity aspect to working from home. Uh, the people who are able to work from home are more typically people who are higher paid, who are higher educated, uh, who have the, uh, those, those are the folks who fill those sorts of jobs. Um, it's not a uniform pattern, but it's there. A second aspect of uh, the, um, of the downturn of the, what happened during COVID was a big increase in online shopping at the expense of going to stores. And again, it seems likely that some of that could well stick. Uh, online shopping, it's something that's been growing faster than uh, traditional retail space for some time, but the activity overall is still pre-crisis, was still very much dominated by uh, going to the store, uh, in order to do your shopping. Um, and uh, that's something that uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, once stores were allowed to reopen, there was a big bump back in terms of uh, traditional shopping uh, and employment rose uh, as well. But uh, the online has remained very significant. Um, this is an example of, you know, there how the crisis in some ways it, it shut down activity for some but opened up opportunities for others so businesses very rapidly needed to up their online game needed to establish an online presence needed to make it easier for their their customers to uh, to buy goods and to accept delivery and it, it created opportunities for the, the software developers, uh, implementers who helped them establish uh, that presence. It also created opportunities for firms like Amazon, the dominant uh, firm in global online activity. And uh, they very rapidly expanded their capacity and this creates some concern about uh, the growth of their potential growth of their market power and uh, its implications for the economy. Some of the other long term structural trends, uh, developments that may become trends, are uh, how we will react to the threat of contagion. How do we protect the health of workers and customers going forward? This could be a key factor shaping the workplace. And it comes through a number of channels. It comes through the terms on which workers are willing to take jobs. It comes through the health and safety standards set by government. And uh, it comes out of firms, well, self-interest at a minimum, uh, interest in protecting the uh, health of their workers and not being shut down by, uh, because of pandemics. So some of these changes could involve fairly modest costs of just providing uh, PPE uh, equipment for workers. Um, it could involve more significant impacts in terms of reconfiguring the works, workspace. And some of those could um, hit productivity and costs. Just think in terms of restaurants that have to uh, uh, limit their uh, the number of customers, have to cut the number of customers they're allowed uh, by 50% to for the allowable space or only let people right now sit on patios. Um, so those developments could have impacts on the workspace in the future. And uh, of course, one of the impacts could come, one of the ways, the most uh, easiest ways to protect workers, well, not the easiest, but uh, one of the surest ways to protect workers from getting sick is to replace them with a robot or other forms of equipment. And uh, the outbreaks that occurred in meatpacking plants for, in uh, southern Alberta and around North America, for example, could change the terms of the uh, 
trade-off made by, uh, faced by establishments, by firms uh, between sometimes low paid workers, sometimes not so low paid workers uh, versus uh, a much, much higher level of, of uh, automation. So that uh, could come into play in terms of shaping the workplace in the years ahead. And finally, um, I guess the, uh, at, a, at a social level, the, the COVID crisis exposed again, the, that there were many parts of our economy, many people who uh, are not well covered by the social safety net, who fell through the cracks. Um, the self-employed, uh, the gig workers, uh, simply uh, are not well covered uh, by uh, the social safety net now. They don't pay employment insurance. And if they had not been uh, covered by the newly established CERB program, they uh, would have uh, fallen back on provincial social assistance programs. And uh, all of the um, cumbersome, I would say, qualification and monitoring processes that those programs uh, impose. So those programs are uh, at play now. Um, they're being remodeled by uh, the federal government uh, and uh, extensions of the temporary programs initially set to uh, expire I mean, more hopeful days. We would have hoped the uh, crisis would be past us are being extended into the future and being redesigned uh, as, we, uh, as we speak. And with that, um, our Division of Labor, Don, I apologize for chewing up too much of the, uh, the clock. Uh, Don will address the uh, sort of policy response going forward, both in terms of uh, income support, how we help people, and uh, how we help the economy in terms of uh, maintaining, uh, facilitating the adjustment that needs to take place. So thank you for listening. Okay, thanks. So Pat has laid out the problem as it was, and I'll turn to some of the solutions. So we agreed that some form of continuing fiscal stimulus would be required, hopefully not at the kind of pace we saw at the height of the pandemic. While we were doing the study, the federal government's task force, the resilient economy, made their recommendations. And I'll just be very brief because I'll say those look pretty good. Uh, it really struck a chord with members of the research group to accomplish more than one objective, if you could. And so there was a lot of keenness of us accomplishing some of the climate objectives, different ways of stimulating an economy. If we think back to the global financial crisis, that was pretty traditional fiscal stimulus, a lot of infrastructure that wasn't particularly green. Um, this time, can you get greater mileage of it? Uh, one feature of what the research group uh, added that hasn't been in the national discourse is they recommended in part to finance the ongoing fiscal stimulus, they recommended an increase in the carbon tax. The other two measures that we're looking at were training and some form of improvement in income support. Basically on training, here lies the problem. Uh, publicly, uh, operated training has never worked particularly well. The private returns to individuals are not particularly high and the social returns are even lower. Uh, part of it is because governments don't even seem to try very hard. A typical training program doesn't even track what happens to people after the training. Do they get a job? Does it know what they train for? What are their wages? And if they do track them, they track them for very short periods of time. So we'll have to do better than that. Uh, we're very much behind as a nation in identifying what the metrics are needed to do various different jobs. Uh, those are much more advanced than most other countries and that creates a major difficulty. We have in Canada just recently created a skills council and one of the things they were supposed to do is do that, but in part because of COVID, they really haven't got off the ground. Uh, the speech from the throne basically says we're going to have a national initiative on training, which is very interesting because training is squarely in the provincial jurisdiction, so I'm not quite sure what they have in mind on that. But given the problem, we'll likely have difficulty ongoing with training, and it's particularly difficult when people are displaced from a job they've had for a long time. They may have had their education, they may have been out of the education system for a long time, they may be a their training is quite specific to an occupation that doesn't exist anymore. And in fact, the record tends to show that general education and 
those circumstances work just as well in some cases better. We have fascinating uh, implications for universities because I think universities have a marketing problem because we tend to, co to correlate uh, colleges with that kind of training, not universities. And just to show you an example of the problems universities face, this uh, skills council I mentioned did not even allow universities to be on their board. Only colleges are represented on their board. So it shows they're kind of starting from a behind position. So if training doesn't get you very far, it really puts the emphasis on better income support. Uh, fascinating experience of the group on income support. It basically created a microcosm of what will probably happen across the country if and when we have a more serious debate about it, i.e. a lot of disagreement. Um, even as to whether it's warranted, I noticed one of the questions, what would be the most prominent argument against it? R really two. Uh, one, of course, is cost. Uh, while we were doing the report, the Parliamentary Budget Office costed out a particular option of it, and it's 47 to $70 billion for a six-month period. Now, mind you, that's at the height because it was a weakness, uh, the weakness of the economy from COVID, but that shows that that could easily cost over $100 billion. A counter-proposal developed by a group in Canada that uh, ha has a different format of it, as over $100 billion a year. So we're already looking at extraordinarily high deficits in debt, and this would be quite expensive. You could argue it would have a lot of benefits, but it has a lot of cost as well at a time we're already running high deficits, and should you, would we raise taxes to raise for it? So we have the basic agreement, is it a great idea or is it not a great idea? But then what was interesting is a sub-coalition of the group that was in favor of it got together and they had some disagreements as well. Quite different designs. Um, one group advocating to target 70% of the poverty level using market-based measure of income. And another group saying that it should be targeted more like the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit of $2,000 a month. And another group saying, they're all, those are too expensive. They're not strategic enough. You should take the existing systems and fill in the cracks. And one way to do that is to enhance the Canada working benefit, which is basically a subsidy to low income workers. It wouldn't address all, all of it. I think um, two of the major advances of the research that should help the debate if it ever gets off the ground in Canada is we've put the focus on working age adults. Typically the debate doesn't encompass that. They throw in children families with with young children and seniors. The poverty rate for seniors is only three and a half percent in Canada. It's basically seniors living in high cost areas. The poverty rate for families with children is seven and a half percent. And with the child tax benefit, we essentially already have the design of a basic income. If we wanted to address that, we could address it with the existing parameters. So the problem in Canada and, and where a lot of the jobs were lost were the working age adults. And secondly, we put the emphasis on using the market-based measure of income, which is Canada's official measure of poverty. Oddly enough, the Parliamentary Budget Office used uh, half of the median income in Canada, so it establishes a relative constant, uh, concept rather than an absolute concept. Um, well, it'd be fascinating to see where these two go, training, as I mentioned, the Speech from the Throne, calling for this enaction initiative in an area, like many in the Speech from the Throne, that aren't in the federal jurisdiction. Oddly enough, of all the initiatives being discussed before the Speech from the Throne, the only one that is not mentioned, not one word in the Speech from the Throne, is the basic income. Although the Liberal Caucus has put it on the agenda for the next Liberal co Policy Conference, and you can be sure with the NDP, holding some power, holding together a minority government that we haven't heard the last of it, but there are many, many difficult design issues. The other one, if you were, the question asked the one, I'll give you the third one as well, of course, the potential for disincentives to work. Um, the higher the payment, um, you could create a disincentive, particularly if you took the income back quite quickly as people gain income, and if you take it back more slowly, of course, the cost of the program goes up. Uh, we are coming within 15 minutes of our close time and we've got to get to the questions and I see there are quite a bit. So maybe Warren, we could turn that back to you and uh, turn to people's questions. Yeah, first off, thanks very much, uh, Pat. Thanks very much, Don. Uh, this has been a really uh, informative look at where things are. I think everybody online appreciates uh, the stats and the thoughts and, and what's come up. Uh, we do have some questions and I'll jump right into them. Uh, the first one, uh, with regard to Patrick's slide number three, 
uh, you made a comment or you made little comments about manufacturing. Uh, were there very uneven impacts across different sub industries within manufacturing? So I'm not sure if you looked at that, Pat, but you can talk about that. Uh, and what has enabled manufacturing to more or less recover all the jo lost jobs by September, even when some of these workers don't really have the option to work from home? Um, yeah, well, let me first of all apologize for not being able to get into uh, any particular depth with, uh, with manufacturing or any of the other sectors uh, as well. Um, how did manufacturing uh, come back as strongly as it has? I mean, I would say that um, it's a very unusual recession in that demand has remained pretty strong. I mean, Canada, along with uh, every other big economy, has stimulated overall demand quite strongly. Um, manufacturing workers were, um, and manufacturing producers overall, uh, were able to bring workers back in uh, a fairly safe way overall. And the sectors that were the individual industries that where there were outbreaks um, have mostly been able to come back um, once the virus was set aside and just implement, you know, basic health and safety requirements. So that's, uh, that's about as far as I could do. It's, it's a very unusual recession that way. Um, <clears throat> the next question, and this is linked to that, is are we ever going to recover to pre-pandemic economic and workforce status. So uh, are we going to get back to where we were at before? Well, maybe I could take a crack at that because I, I think we have to parse that question a little bit. Are we talking about in aggregate or are we talking about the composition? Uh, in aggregate, probably. Uh, in composition, absolutely not. Um, you know, the main point I think we should draw from pass is there's going to be phenomenal dislocation and you know coming back to that University of Chicago report that he referred I think there was shock and awe around the world when they released that that said that 40 percent of the people who lost their jobs will not get them and then the reality sets in that's not much different than a normal cyclical experience there is phenomenal churn going on in the labor market all the time and when you have disruptions even if it's even I mean if it's a major recession but most particularly the pandemic they don't come back looking anything like they did before and of course that creates winners and where there's winners uh, and the aggregates to say that it creates losers and then comes this difficulty how do you address the people that are left out from it and you lay on to top of that, there were trends that were going on before that will probably go on before. Our natural resource sector has been in the doldrums for at least six years. You know, talk of peak uh, oil supply has been replaced in a very short period of time of peak oil demand. Maybe that's not going to come back. And for the manufacturing output and particularly employment has been on a strong downward trend for 20 years. Mm -hmm probably not going to change and on top of that you've got all this dislocation so i would say yeah but two parts at some point in aggregate but the composition will be terribly different and the skill mix then will be terribly different as well i think this is a, a good way to think about it you know we do expect growth but have what it's going to look like i guess if you have a crystal ball and you can figure that out you can really get ahead of things um Craig is asking a question, uh, kind of a devil's advocate question. What's the best argument against a guaranteed annual income, given what we know about the transformation of the labor market? I don't know if either one of you want to try to take that one on. Well, I mean, the two traditional arguments are, are the cost. Is that the best argument? I, I, I don't know. In part, that's a timing issue. And part that needs a more sophisticated debate. Maybe it's still a good idea and the cost should be met by higher taxes. Um, we haven't had that debate in Canada. In the brief discussion we had over the summer, a major initiative is the only thing the Liberal government has said, no, we're not contemplating anything major in the tax side. Maybe we should. And the second element is the potential for disincentives to work. But you know, again, it's a very complicated measure. One could argue the other side of it. One could say, having the comfort and security of a basic income would actually allow you to invest in yourself and take some training and take some chances 
to get a better job over the last term, it actually may actually be incentive to work in a different way in a, in a manner that's more fulfilling for you. Um, I just, I, to me, it just flabbergasts me because we have two gigantic initiatives we're discussing in Canada in the last year, farmer care and the basic income. And the discussions are so superficial relative to the complexity of them. And there's so many options. I like in both cases, you could do what I call the big bang and everybody thinks it'll replace everything that moves or you can fill in the cracks. They're both reasonable. And some, a lot of the downsides that you come, particularly in the cost side, could be addressed by a more strategic approach. But we need to have that out and, and we've never had it. And it's certainly no details in the speech from the throne that would foster that kind of debate. I, I guess that's why we're supposed to be here. <laughs> Maybe to do our bit to prod that along. Excellent. Pat, do you have anything to throw in there? Yeah, um, a little bit. I mean, I think that uh, cost is uh, a big concern. Um, on top of that, if, if you are willing to assume that there is a limit to how much you can spend, if you're not willing to accept that, then, you know, a lot of the arguments against it go by the board. Um, if you think it's going to pay for itself or if you think there is no such thing as, uh, as scarcity. But if, if you assume that there is a, a sort of fixed budget that uh, the economy is able to produce or people across the economy population are, are willing to chip in in taxes, then there's a question of is targeting more uh, a universal basic income, a guarantee, literally, if taken that way, means that you're spreading the money over everybody. Are you targeting the money most effectively? Would that be better? I mean, are people who are disabled that face particular obstacles being left out of the mix in comparison to, uh, to what could be done if you address their issues or help them address their issues more directly? Thanks guys. Um, we've got a question, it's, it's aimed at Don, but Pat, I'm sure you can jump in too. Uh, what important lessons uh, can we learn from the pandemic uh, as we move forward uh, in terms of economic workforce and education areas? It's a pretty broad question. Uh, any thoughts? I would say that there's no room for complacency. We're, we're very fortunate in Canada, I mean, when we go back to the Second World War, we're, we're a pretty wealthy country. And yeah, we can talk about the wide income distribution and, and the like, but it's not particularly bad relative to other countries. And interestingly enough, it, it widened in the 70s and 80s. It hasn't widened further since then. So we haven't even done relatively basis in that. Um, but we've been powered by, as I said, natural resources and for a long time by manufacturing. And they're not going to disappear, but they don't look like they'll be the powerhouses. And we got to think about What's going to replace it? It's not an obvious thing. Um, yeah, one presumes it's going to be in a clean growth area involving clean tech, but you know, in Canada, we're pretty good at creating businesses. They're pretty good at growing for a while, and then they enter in Canada the valley of death. They don't tend to make the jump into larger status that would add to employment and income and exports, and they tend to sell out once they start to doing that. So we've got problems. We've also had a very nice, cozy, lucrative relationship to the United States and the last number of years has shown us we can't take that relationship for granted. The United States economy's got its own problems. Talk about all the fiscal problems, theirs are way worse than ours. Then we thought, well, we'll cozy up to China and that will fill that gap. That doesn't look too uh, obvious either. So what does that all mean? I think it means that we have to have a much more dynamic economy. We have to be better educated, we have to be better trained, and we have to be much more adept at moving people and resources from one place and one sector and one occupation to another. And yeah, we've all got it, young people have got it. You're not going to be doing the same thing for your whole life. You're probably not gonna be in the same occupation, but we're pretty slow at making those kinds of shifts and, and moving those resources around, but I think that's what the future looks like and we have to embrace that. And uh, universities have an absolutely critical uh, role to play in that. You know, I was, I was very intrigued two years ago when we started the, there's a group uh, between universities and the business sector to try to figure out how to work that out. But they basically just concentrated on experiential learning, which is very important, but they haven't done anything more than that. They haven't kind of lined up. 
with what university could do, or what would best feature that economy. But I, I think that's part of the thing, not being complacent, that everybody probably needs to do things differently and better to secure a, a really good future. Um, we've got, oh, go ahead, Pat, jump in. Okay, well, just, just filling in one, one small item. It's not small in the grand scheme of things, but relative to what Don was addressing, um, I talk about, um, I think about our attitude towards risk and uh, particularly to what tends to happen after, uh, after any crisis. Uh, we've gone through uh, pandemics before and uh, we've gone through other uh, emergencies and we, we learn from them uh, for a while and we step up our uh, emergency management uh, practices. Um, but uh, I think we develop a, a kind of sense of, uh, of complacency. I think we have to uh, instead recognize or try to recognize the, the costs that, are, that need to be addressed, need to be built in in terms of being ready when um, disaster strikes. Um, it's a cost that, uh, that has to be paid. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's a lesson that we will probably again forget because we tend to, uh, we tend to sort of forget the things that have happened in the, uh, in the more, distant, uh, more distant past. But hopefully we'll stick with it a bit. Yeah, well, thanks Pat, because I think you've kind of addressed one of the two questions that remain, uh, which came from Craig, you know, what's the cost of the dislocation compared to the cost of something like a guaranteed income? How might that influence what we think about? And then the other last thought from Leo uh, is uh, just asking for your thoughts on uh, how different professional services will return. Uh, he raises the elevator challenge, you know, moving people around in these big buildings and what's going to happen as, uh, you know, businesses move forward. So I'll put it out to the two of you. If, if either of you want to jump in on, on either of those questions, and then we'll wrap up this session. Well, just in terms of the, uh, the elevator challenge and uh, Leo's question, I would say that, uh, you know, we always have to remember that what happens with the virus is number one. It's not the economy that's driving what we're seeing so far. It's what's happening on the, the public health front. And the fact that we've still got 4 million people working at home, uh, that's not going to really change in a significant way, I would say, until uh, the virus is well and truly tamed. And once it does, then hopefully the elevator, who gets in the elevator, in what order uh, problem, uh, will, uh, will go away. Um, Any last thoughts, Don? And, you know, go back to that cliche, change means opportunity. Just one tiny example. The, the presumption, what you read in the newspapers, is everybody's going to pull back to their borders. We, we went globalization of supply chain. We're going to get that. But is that true? <laughs> and we've also demonstrated that uh, people can work from home. We can connect people in phenomenal ways. Or why not connect people around the world? I'm not sure that that will necessarily happen. But we're going to see global shifts. So I think somebody who's involved in the tactical advice on global supply chains uh, could make a fortune out of this. There's gonna be a huge demand for that. Uh, just in the whole workplace environment that Pat thought, I mean, they're gonna be complex environments. It's not gonna be everybody working from home. It's not gonna be everybody, a hybrid model. And the balance, how do you get the highest satisfaction? How do you get the highest profitability out of that? I think a lot of people have based on that. Just mass transit um, built on the sole purpose of getting people to downtown at peak hours and go back. What's going to happen to that? How will that counselor, what that does to urban demand? So there's all kinds of things. Um, you know, I, it, it's, it's interesting because when we've had crises before, we tend to throw the environment out the window and it doesn't, it's not happening this time. It's got legs that it's never happened before and we're trying to achieve that goal. So I, I, how we can move things, not just new clean tech and clean growth indices, but ones that maybe are dirty, how they can get cleaner. I think there's going to be lots of jobs coming in those areas. And it comes back to that thing again. The, We'll come back to some kind of pre-crisis employment level, but it'd be very, very different. But that means that some will be way up 
and got to pick those ones and drive them. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you for a fascinating talk. Uh, there have been great questions. Uh, thanks to everybody who participated online. Uh, taking an hour out of your day, we know it's a big commitment. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us. Uh, we do have another uh, Contagion Culture Talk lined up for next week, uh, taking a historic look at other pandemics in the past and, and drawing some lessons from that. So I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Pat and Don for a tremendous talk and thanking the teams that put together this work. And we really look forward to uh, seeing you all again in the next week or so. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Sign off now. Thank you. See you. Bye now.